Happy Monday, everybody. Hey, Andrew. Oh, you there? Oh, I, I had to sneeze, so I muted myself. Ah, there we go. How's it going, Andrew? I think you're about to have a colonoscopy before, don't you? <laughs> uh, Brian, Brian is here. He just stepped away to go, I think, use the restroom. I meant to die standing in the back. Uh, oh, the no. Mask, that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've got a, we've got a visitor join us today. Just take a look at how, how we do some of the stuff here. Here, here, here. It's okay. You don't have to talk about it. We understand. <laughs> it's good that you're taking that proactive health. <laughs> did you have a good weekend? I, I did. I had a very, I worked through the weekend, but it was very productive work. So you know, oh, good. I mean, it was a very good weekend. I got to play a little, I did, uh, actually, I actually did this last week, but uh, I did, I actually did do a little VR yesterday and, uh, yeah. Oh, you're waiting for us, Charles. Yeah, there we go. It also looks like we got Justin on the line here. Uh, you're doing some VR? Is you, are you working on a new VR project? or? No, no. I, I've been fully spending my time working with OpenAI. This was more of just chill out and relax. Mm -mm -mm. So, very cool. Kind of the... I, uh, I'm, I'm still very interested on... Oh, gosh, I love the form factor of the Quest, right? The, the standalone... VR thing, mm -hmm. but uh, the Oculus stuff just still. Just, I'm just really surprised there aren't competitors as a market in that space, given how much money you would think HTC and and Valve have uh, invested in it. Yeah, we could talk. Actually, we'll talk about it because I don't know if you saw Facebook announce Facebook Horizon, and I didn't get a bit into that. I okay. think that um, though the the issue is Facebook made a big bet. Facebook decided to, uh, man, this is my stupid voice. Um, I'll just turn down my volume a little bit. You're, um, you're hearing yourself? Oh. Uh, keep, keep talking. Let me see if I can do something about that. All right. This is me. Hello. My stupid voice in my own stupid ears. Okay. How's that? Is that... I eat this very not stupid cookie. Um, hello. Oh, my God. I heard myself now. Thank you. Okay. Um, let me see. So. Uh, oh gosh, I'm sorry. We, uh, oh, we were talking about Facebook Horizon. Yeah, no, um, yeah, just saying it's like, the problem is, it's like, they did the very strategic thing. They dropped the price of the Oculus Quest. The engineering on the Quest is amazing. I, I have not been that impressed with the consumer electronics device in a long time. When you look at how efficient they are, how smart they did things. Mm -hmm. And I think it caught everybody else off by guard, off guard. Mm -hmm. The upside is that, like, think of, but think of like the Quest kind of like the iPad. When Apple came out with the iPad, nobody else could compete right away, you know, because Apple had thought through a number of things about efficiencies, battery, stuff like that. Now you can get a $50 Android tablet and it's better than the first iPad. You know, yeah. the, you know $50 Android tablet is actually a really solid device considering. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think we're going to get that with VR. We're going to get it where it will reach a point where the devices will be cheap. What's going to matter are going to be the ecosystems. Yeah. Oh, right. Because, yeah. I mean, like, if you look at what, what was the before the Quest the Go, which had mm -hmm. did not have the Oculus Rift library. And so it was limited in terms of what uh, software was, you could. could it was 3D. It was 3D OF. So it wasn't even 60 six OF. So you couldn't move around. It was just your yeah. head on a swivel. And so, you know. The problem was there was a huge investment in VR because once you know once people were able to do like you know gear or cardboard or whatever, there was excitement over it, and there was a ton of money and a ton of VC into it, mm -hmm. and it was really poorly timed because just the hardware wasn't there. Now hardware's there, but people are like, well, no, let's see, and that's that's yeah. like most bubbles. Uh, Justin, what do you think about VR? Uh, I. Like I, 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 at some point will jump back in, and I will be very, very thrilled at where things have advanced. Um, you know, to to this point, uh, I mean, I'll tell you what, we could actually probably do it easier now because our previously cluttered uh, area that we used for uh, that here in the studio that was kind of like an office now is a set, so it is it is kind of cleared out 
a lot more than it was before. There's a lot mm -hmm. more room. Uh, therefore, like the stuff we have there wouldn't take a whole lot to move to make it go. So we could actually have a lot of floor space for it. So yeah, I don't know. Maybe at some point when the election ends in December, uh, I'll, I'll <laughs> treat myself. Bro. Oh. Brian, what are your thoughts December, on December? That's optimistic. <laughs> I know, I know. I, we're actually, there, I mean, I'm, Ashley I, and I, I, Ashley I, and I were trying to think about doing a, a vacation or just some little, like, just rent a house on Airbnb somewhere just so we could not look at the same four walls. And, like, uh, she's like, all right, well, probably mid November. And I'm like, yeah, yeah you know, like, <laughs> assuming that the election's done. <laughs> you should. I mean, you should already register the podcast, like the count, you know, like uh, raise the dead 2.5, the count. Let's talk about 2000 and 2020 and the eerie similarities. I know. I know. It's I, I am going to call our election night coverage night one. So I do know <laughs> yeah. that that's going to be the branding is night one of our election night coverage. Uh, as far as VR, like number one. I mean, I played Half-Life Alex and I saw her face and now I'm a believer, but uh but like I think the transformative Very moment cute. has to be that uh self-contained self-contained unconstrained. I think those are the two keys and then all of a sudden VR is everywhere. Like if you can I would if if you can wake up, go an entire day and function uh, where everything is translated and you never bump into anything uh, and uh, everything is procedurally generated for you, then I think that that'll be the moment that 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 it that's its Minecraft moment is what I think. I, I think that's setting it way too high because like a lot of other like, you know, we had video game PlayStations and Nintendos and stuff that we were perfectly happy that sat in front of in one room and we used extensively it was the price point the price point at a certain point and the software had a certain point you know you hit those two things but i think self-contained yeah like that's i use the quest whatever i can because it's just i just put it on and i'm there um and, and doesn't have again there's no lighthouse trackers there's none of that it's all you know you just put it on you know you can walk in any room in your house and go play it or you can a lot of stuff you can just do sitting it's it's tough too because uh, uh, we we've all had different moments of aha, and and they mm -hmm. they've occurred at different levels, right? So it's like at this point, uh, you know, my aha moment happened to be the Vive, and yours happened to be the Quest, and you know. Well, um, to be fair, my aha moment was when I did the beta of the Vive, and I tried telling you guys how cool it was to have six degrees of freedom. Right. And you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, we What's thought it? you were full of bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm hey, like, hey, yeah, hey, you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, man, why don't, why don't it, you go write another novel, Michael Crichton? <laughs> I was like, you guys like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, no, when you move around, it's a totally different experience. And then you went and did it like, oh, my God, when you move around, it's a, I'm like, oh, really? Oh, okay. Oh, that, now you're sold. I mean, my describing this VR experience, it's, and obviously you have to experience it. That is the thing. It's like somebody can't tell you. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's really cool. You yeah, know, like, you could totally look, yeah. see the bar. All I'm, say, all I'm saying is, we got the tattoos, and I, you never got the tattoo. That's uh... <laughs> I had a dev kit. I had the original <laughs> Oculus dev kit, Brian. Mm. <laughs> OG Oculus developer here. We don't need VR purity tests, everybody. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah, I'm no. well, being challenged. <laughs> I had I'm, the just glad, I'm just glad that we can see this demeasuring contest in Six Degrees <laughs> yeah. of Freedom. <laughs> I, I had that. I have boxes filled with VR lenses and stuff from building my own gear. <laughs> uh, alrighty. Uh, it sounds like everyone's in good. We're going good. You guys want to I mean, not for nothing, but Justin and uh, I were stars okay. of Discovery oh VRs. My God. It, it, it doesn't matter. Shut it up. Matter. <laughs> now what's the Yeah, you had your lawnmower man moment. I'm very proud of you. You're, you're lawnmower <laughs> Uh, right. oh, oh, I love that there's so many directions to measure a D. <laughs> I know. Oh my, it's like I'm here. Wow. <laughs> Look at these D's. All right, you guys want to start a show? Ready. Sure. All right, Andrew, I'll count you in. In <laughs> three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, beautiful people. Justin Robert Young. Hello. 
and Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. That's me. Gentlemen, I need to switch my network right now. I apologize. Give me one point. <laughs> yeah, we could we could restart. Well, we'll... <laughs> uh, uh, did you slip over to Starbucks? Oh, he might I'm, have. I'm go- yeah, it just got better. Sorry. <laughs> okay. okay. Sorry. We'll, we'll, we'll do. We'll catch you in again. All right. In three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello. Mr. Brian Brushwood. Yo, 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 yo. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hey, everybody. Back and better than ever. So, gentlemen, I uh, want to talk to you about a very interesting product reveal, technology reveal that happened last week. And our new overlords, the Neuropigs. Sorry? I, 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 th- I thought this was going to be like the 120 hertz uh, display on an iPhone, but uh, Neuropigs sounds Neuropigs. like an awesome band. Could be, because, you know, uh, cyborgs are among us. They're cyber pigs. As Elon Musk unveiled, talked about, they gave us an update on Neuralink. And in the announcement, he basically gave sort of a status update to say where Neuralink was. It wasn't really showing too much about the advancement, although they've improved the robot and some of the sensing in this thing that's able to connect to your head. Now they're implanting these things in pigs. So apparently the market for brain enhancement in pigs is pretty huge. Yeah. Um, Everybody short uh, your stock in bacon because we're about to find out just how intelligent pigs are. Yeah. So they uh, basically at this reveal, what he wanted to do, said the goal of this was for hiring and they wanted to show people where Neuralink was and they wanted to showcase basically off you know some of the tech but then show the state of the art with what they've been doing and what they now do is they have a a coin size like a half dollar sized implant that they pull out part of the skull they have a robot that does this thing that totally doesn't look terrifying they pull out part of the skull put in the implant and they put all these sort of little threads that connect to the upper part of your cortex can 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 we take just a moment to pause and really drink in the fact that Everything was said unironically, just like like matter uh, of fact, like 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 five, hey, we five drilled years into ago. This pig's skull. Yeah, like like five years ago, that might have been a bit that we were doing, but uh, instead we're we're reading from an AP article. <laughs> so yeah, there's a lot. There have been other advances that have come there, and so I think they're kind of doing their approach towards this. So I don't think they have a a new overall approach, sort of different strategies. But you know, the goal for this right now is to help people who have brain disorders. Like, you know, they're looking at basically they've got breakthrough funding. They've got breakthrough approval from the FDA to basically help tetraplegics, people which there's just no no treatments for right now to basically help them try to see if they can reconnect. One of the things they talk about doing is putting a neural link in your head and then another one, let's say the base of your spine, if you suffered a spinal injury, and using it to connect and send signals. And in the demonstration, they showed the pigs wired up and the, the data coming from the pigs is fascinating, right? They put a pig on a treadmill, which you've never seen a pig on a treadmill. You need to see a pig on a treadmill. It's adorable. And from, it is. And then from the signals from the brain, oh, they're able to map little that. Legs. Look at those <laughs> little legs going on the treadmill. So you see that? They, you can see the little dots on the image. That is the brain. They're picking up from the brain the position of the limbs. So brain, oh, so that's brain, where, brain, that's where the basically... brain is. Yeah, the, the yeah. brain is thinking this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, yep. this one, this one, and and that's how walking is done. This one went to market, right? <laughs> so this is yeah. So this is all the muscles that need to get activated, all the movements like that is. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's awesome. Then in another demonstration, they actually showed what happens when you listen to the nerves in the snout, and as this pig starts, you know snorting through and touching everything and you hear this if you can play the, the sound let's see shuffles around and touches something with a snout but that sends out uh neural spikes which are detected oh here. my um, word and so on the screen um you can see uh each each of the, the spikes from the thousand oh my word this and, this is um uh, a, a, a smell around. is 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 number one magic like the idea that 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 something not there that you can detect uh is magic but 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 to be able to process and record it like a fingerprint is even 
Now, we, we need to be very careful here, especially because we got Tally Zarell in our our chat here and let's let's be, let's qualify here okay my, uh, like mom mom will bust us on this <laughs> and, 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 and for neuroscientists for people in neuroscientists this is a very frustrating thing because they're watching a bunch of chimpanzees sharing at shiny things going ooh, 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 and they're like it doesn't we're staring at a mirror going look at this tv it's amazing yeah, yeah. it does um, it does make me very happy that we have one adult in the chat every single yeah. episode it makes me very so, happy <laughs> what yeah, what they're doing is they have uh, this this implant. I think has like a thousand. This was I think they said it had a thousand, or they're capable of like a thousand different threads to try to measure different groups of neurons as they fire. Now, to get real precise, you need a lot more ways of channels to be able to do that. And we're far away from here. Here, they're able to me measure major muscle groups, large things firing. It is not a very discrete thing. It's not like. I don't even know if we were picking up smell from that. That could have just been nose twitches and stuff like this. So, which would be a, which would be a, a re reflection of some kind of experience that the the nose oh yeah. was happening. It, it, it's a it's a second degree indicator. But sure, I mean, it's not nothing, is what I'm trying to say. Like like yeah. like we could be excited. Absolutely, yeah. It is a a step forward. Well, and and. You know, we saw a lot of this during the handheld boom of the aughts and the tens that a lot of these things had been done before. It wasn't mm -hmm. like the, a lot of what we saw in the iPhone and the iPad and, and, you know, all the devices that Google came out with and Samsung were things that were necessarily made up from whole cloth. The, the, the worth was putting it in people's pockets and getting it down to a price and in a finished product that people really really were excited about and i think that's ultimately the idea that you know tally zarell is somebody that has worked in you know neuroscience for for many years uh that things that she has seen in a lab are now things that are you know being at least discussed by that company as more consumer facing than a lab work is like that's remarkable, specifically if it can come to market, like a pig, like, yeah, a, like it, a little piggy. Yeah, and it's it's a it's the the kind of thing here is the idea of a concentration of effort of taking people who might have been in laboratories, putting in them same building with engineers building hardware and some computer scientists, which happens in some labs and some places too today to be sure, but trying to ten x that and then under the guidance of Elon Musk, who has been very successful at rockets and cars and stuff, and working with. Let's make this very clear. It's it's not like Elon has decided he's going to be chief neuroscientist here. You know, rockets is one thing because that's in his wheelhouse. So he's got neuroscientists and other people working there to do this. Elon's ability to sort of say, okay, this is how we'll with this, with the technology side, this is we'll organize the research. You tell us what direction we need to go in, and let's figure out how to make that happen. So how long until we see a similar uh uh demonstration only in the reverse direction where it's like you're thinking a thing and you're controlling a thing Be, because this this seems to be monitoring uh uh demonstration and and uh, what we want to do well, is control giant robots well that's the 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 goal of using that let's say being able to map limb movement whatever to see if there's an intentionality there is that that's when they're going to move into their next step basically when they're going to be putting this into people, the goal is going to be eventually is to be able to control them. But they say that these these the devices, they can send and receive signals through the threads. Right. So that's another thing, too, is the ability it could send information back in and give you some sort of feedback. I mean, that's sort of to figure out how to do that in a precise way, I think, is a way off sort of thing because it is the friggin' brain. And these things are, you know, delicate, but on a broader sense, maybe soon. Yeah, we might. We've seen other other implant technologies able to let people do sort of some sort of control by trying to like concentrate on something or whatever and measuring both. We've done that externally, and now we've done it. There's like you know deep cranial you know sensing and stuff, which is very intrusive and stuff. So, 
could happen. Yeah, uh, Tally in in the chat room again says one of the most revolutionary things that Musk is doing with Neuralink is bringing all these experts from different fields and giving them a gigantic check. The fact that they can literally just focus on delivering and not have to worry about writing grants or funding in and of itself is a revolution in this field. Thousand percent, thousand percent. When you get when the fourth richest man in the world says, let's make this happen. Tell me what you need. Tell me who you need. Oh, we need more yeah. people. Great. Let's go do, we'll go make a live presentation, show what we're doing so we can get all, you know, people, anybody, anybody who wants to sort of work with us can apply to us. So it, it's absolutely, because in, in, you know, Tally brings up just a great point of like so much of trying to be a researcher at institution university is grant writing, grant writing, grant writing, trying to justify what you're doing and doing that. Research publishing is part of it. We need to publish when you're working for an organization like that. But the grant writing is so time consuming. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, money does make the world go round, Andrew. And that's why I would like to have all of you go round to patreon.com slash weird things. So that smooth. keeps this so smooth. Perfect. Keeps keep, this keep, podcast keep it going. Keep going. It going. It's not smooth when you call it out. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's uh, more smooth. It's uh, smooth out this read when you oh, make we're it we're pitching for our Patreon right now. Dog oh, right I didn't here's, even notice that. Here's the wind up and here's the pitch for you to go to patreon.com <laughs> slash weird things. Uh, get your custom RSS feed. Make sure that this show continues to happen. Patreon.com slash weird things. That was really hats off to you, sir. Hats off to you, the smooth salesman, Justin Robert Young. <laughs> That's me. That's the smooth salesman. <laughs> so there was a announcement last week in the world of VR, and that is that Facebook has doing its its beta, its public beta now for Horizons. And Horizons, for those who don't know, is their VR open world. Horizon, which is basically a world you go into using your Oculus device and you can go talk to people, you can play games. And on surface, it's a lot like Rec Room, if you've seen that, and some other, you know, kind of do what you sort of want. And you can build things. You can go in there, you can create things like Rec Room. And it's, but it's Facebook, and it's got a big, huge effort behind it. And this seems to be kind of the wave of the future of what they want to sort of build. Man, I, I, I wish I didn't have this irrational distaste for Facebook full stop um, because there's probably something good here, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try it. I'm not going to load it. I'm not going to do it. I, I'm upset with. Well, all right. Uh, let, let's actually kind of unpack that because I do think that if this were so cool that like your kids really wanted to do it, you'd try it. If it was so cool that me and Andrew and Bryce were really into it, you would try it. However, I do think that there is something to be said here and one of the other big stories that came out of Oculus uh, over the last week is the idea that going forward, they are going to require a Facebook account to log in. Right, Andrew? So, yeah, that's the other thing. It's they're, they're phasing that in when Facebook first acquired Oculus. Uh, Palmer Lucky made a statement that was authorized by Facebook and said that you are never going to require to use a Facebook login for your oculus rift facebook has now said coming like 2022 you're going to now be required to use a facebook login for your oculus so uh that is frustrating um i like i'm one of these people like i don't go on facebook i don't i it's not for me and i'm hesitant i but i like i use my oculus quest because i love the quest and when they come out with the next generation quest, I will buy that. My reason is there ain't nothing else out there. There's no, there's no competition for it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and that's, that's the question is, is this moment in VR going to be hurt by Facebook kind of saying, Hey, look, we bought this company for a reason. And if it's going to gain adoption and we do believe we have a best in class product here, then we're going to take the data. We are going to take the information that comes from it because that's what makes Facebook go. Uh, or is it something that we worry about? And in the abstract, we can say, absolutely not. I would, uh, I'm, I'm put off by this, but ultimately if the product is the product and the software is the software, then 
we're just going to go along with it because we use an account to log into a bunch of stuff now that we probably aren't in love with. Man, I would love to believe that like, you know, no, I've got my principles and my privacy concerns and I'm just over here with my arms folded. But the fact is like, they just need the right game and they'll seduce <laughs> me right in. Yeah. And, and that is, I think it largely because there aren't alternatives for, for the portable. There just aren't right now, you know? And I think that that's, they're going to be in a different situation. They're right now, like all of my friends who have quests, I would say that 60% of them use them on a regular basis. They're like quest heads. Like they just love it. And I have some of them very, it's one of these things. It's very much early adopter cycle where you get the ones that kind of like, I have like, you know, one of my friends, Simon was a guy that was waiting for years to jump into VR because he had his little checklist. It's got to be portable. You know, I don't have to connect to a computer. It's got to do this, this, this. And when the quest came out, he got it. Simon is like just huge into it. Simon's one of the co-creators of the magic puzzle thing that I, I brought up before. And Simon gave me a call the other day and he said, hey, I'm working on a game in Rec Room. Do you want to come help me out? And I'm like, well, let me let me finish doing my work on artificial intelligence and let me go have my most futuristic day ever by helping my friend with his project in VR. And we go inside of Rec Room, which is a game that's on all, you know, basically on every device. It's a company that was started by some former Microsoft people. And that's very much most of what you saw with Horizon Rec Room does that. And I go meet him in this, this space, and then we go into the zone where, like, he's the virtual him, where you see kind of, he looks like one of his characters with the hands and the torso and the head. And he's built this different kind of, you know, shooting game, a shooting fighting game, because he had some different ideas on combat and stuff. And so he's walking around showing me this thing and quickly becomes just not weird. You know, we're like, oh, I'm building this over here. And he shows me the interface to build stuff, which all of a sudden he gives me the maker pen. And all of a sudden these circuit boards appear in front of you and these if and junctions and stuff. And it was, you know, it was amazing to see how this thing works. And then we start talking and we both just sit down and our avatars are just sitting down in VR as we talk for a half an hour about like the project. And I'm like, and I'm like, we this is weird. Just I'm looking at his VR simple little head and we're just carrying on having this conversation in a completely but, VR space. But, and I'm like, but it's weird. Not just that you're looking at his head, but that you're picking up actual emotional cues from very tiny micro muscular movements. You know, it's like, it's, it's real. I mean, they're, 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 they're the telepresence is a real experience. Absolutely. And, and that was that. And then he said, Hey, I got a gun. I'm having VR brain. Cause I think he'd been in VR like, for the part, better part of the day. But like, that is the thing is the weight of that thing on your head sets in for a while. The lenses, VR lenses, Oculus is working on a pretty cool advancement in lenses, which is going to basically be this adaptive sort of thing. So things will be, have different ranges of focus, which is going to be a very, it's one of these things you hear about it and you kind of go, I guess so. I mean, I kind of, I'm okay with it now. I just want more resolution. But everybody who tries it goes, no, when you see this, it just, everything pops and becomes real. I don't worry about field of view anymore when I'm in VR. I don't even think about that. Like that is just, it's, it's, it's all there for you. You don't, you don't feel restricted that there's something off the edge of your sight line that you can't see. Yeah. I don't notice it anywhere nearly as much as I did before. Cause I think that like with the quest, which is a similar to the other ones has a pretty good one. And I think we could use, but I think as these things get bigger and more expansive and we saw before how Oculus is working on, next generation goggles that are much thinner and lighter um it's gonna be it 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 you know it, like you know brian said the moment in which it's let me just put these things on and walk everywhere i want you know you know that's the the, the vr singularity point so to speak yeah oh totally totally although i do think that you know especially considering we spend a lot more time appreciating our homes lately like hmm. if we're looking for christmas potential like i think uh, you know a the, the the quest could be a a massive i mean it, like we've always been saying you know oh vr adoption vr adoption vr adoption but like i kind of think like there's a lot of things that are falling in place both from a hardware and societal perspective that could see a big adoption for this little timmy would you like to go outside would i well you can't but put these on it'll kind yes. of feel like it <laughs> and it'll kind of feel yeah raising your children in vr <laughs> uh you could do that remotely too so I have a, I found maybe the coolest Wikipedia page ever. And let me just 
open this in my browser here. You ready for this? Ready. Um, list of people who disappeared mysteriously. Full, wait, sorry, full stop? That's, that's a thing? Well, they have pre-1970, then they have after 1970, and then after 1970, uh, or actually by, uh, you can actually get breakdowns, you know, by like, you get to the 1900s, they do like, kind of like, really crazy specific. And I'll well, give wait a you, minute, uh, hold on. This is like, literally, the, the, the unsolved mysteries pre-production list. <laughs> it's yeah. just like, a, this is amazing. Let, let me start with the first entry. Circa 700 BC, Romulus, the founder and first king of Rome, age at least 60, ah! missing from Rome. One day, Romulus was reviewing his troops in the campus marshes near where the Pantheon is now. There was a sudden storm with lightning and thunderclaps. A thick black cloud hid him from view, and no one ever saw him again. Some people standing nearby said that he had been swept away by the tempest. Livy and Plutarch say Romulus's generals may have used the opportunity to assassinate him. You want to talk unsolved mysteries? This is the real work right here. Exactly. Yeah. If you or someone you know have any information on Romulus's whereabouts, please call. <laughs> so it is a fascinating list. Some of these were like, you know, uh, organized crime boss, you know, uh, Punchy Luciano was leaving a New Jersey cafe after a dispute with so and so <laughs> and was never seen again. I'm like, yeah, geez, mm, you know, but other ones are just are just fascinating. Uh, you know, like emperors and some kings and some other people go missing, you know, just just fascinating. So, anyhow, if you want to take a look through there, and I think you could, we could probably, I don't know, let me pick uh, actually, I want to, I want to do, I want to look up some of the more. Contemporary, but let's just pick one. We're gonna, I'm gonna have you guys try to solve sure, it. Sure, yeah. we'll solve right, it. Let's solve it. Yeah, yeah, no, we're good at that. All right, solve things all the time. And um, it's aliens. Do, 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 do. <laughs> aliens. So let's go with. I'm just gonna do random. Way, I really okay. didn't enjoy the aliens episode of Unsolved Mysteries. <laughs> it kind of killed the vibe for me. All right, I got. Uh, all right, uh, here's clue number one. This person has a nickname. <laughs> Okay. Raymond Crane Neck Nugent, uh, missing from old Crane Neck, missing from Miami Dade County, Florida. Florida man. Ah, uh, there we go. Egan's Rats gang member, killer and bank robber. <laughs> in quotes, holy wow, wait, man, you're hitting us with a lot real fast. All right, so he's a gang member, a killer, and a bank robber, and from Florida. And yep, his name yep. is Crane Neck. Got it. Yep. And in a lesson Wikipedia, quote, vanished. They literally yeah. quotes there. Quote, vanished. Yeah. No trace of him was ever found. I mean, uh, what year? What year are we talking about? 1931. Where were you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brian, we actually, uh, you know, we were uh, uh, talking in the, in the pre-show. I don't know if it was at the beginning of this podcast about some uh, VR videos we shot. And one of those, I think we had a bit of a different experience because uh, we were down in the Everglades on a fan boat. And the only thing I could think of that I was like, I wanted to, you know, this is a family run operation uh, that, that was operating these fan boats. And all I wanted to do was just edge toward so what's the craziest stuff you've ever seen out here in the everglades without making any kind but, of accusations between the lines what you wanted to do was find out like okay what happened here for Crane 20 neck. years <laughs> yeah <laughs> like uh like uh how many bodies have, have uh have vanished out here uh and and uh spoiler alert i'm i'm just going to declare it that's where Crane neck ended up like if you are, <laughs> if the Everglades is an amazing natural resource, it also is a place where nobody could realistically find anything specifically if you go deep into it uh, and everything just decomposes with everything else in the water. Uh, it is a, a insane place that not only has been where many vanishings in South Florida, I'm sure have legitimately ended, but also, uh, you know, you got to get out there on something. It's only so many fan boats. 
you know, maybe you'd let somebody know, hey, uh, you know, don't worry. There's going to be a bag of money, and I hope you have a great night's sleep tonight. Make sure that the keys are in the boat. Uh, that was kind of the vibe I got from our tour guide. Uh, our <laughs> tour guide had seen some stuff. I, I, yes. Yeah. You should uh, check out my upcoming book, Black Coral, which deals with things going missing in the Everglades. <laughs> <laughs> I just say things like it, it was amazing have, because have, I, I have used to live. There, there, there was a TikTok video of what uh, a, a alligator looks like. Like you see, you see the head moving along the surface. You don't often think about what the rest of the alligator looks like. Uh, if, if Bryce can find it, it's, it's worthy of a few seconds attention. And just, it's reading some of the more contemporary things, but a lot of it looks like just, you know, some of it like, you know, so-and-so was in a fight with her husband about paternity. And then she was unable to show up at the hearings. They're like, uh -huh. so I'm looking for the cool ones. A lot of them are just kind of crazy. How many in Florida? Yeah, I mean, well, you know what, Brian? Um, some, <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot of it is. It, I'm just, it's just spooky because you start reading through these sort of things, and it's like, you know, you know, this woman Tiffany Daniels in Pensacola, Florida. That was just totally random. Uh, yeah. So Daniels, a theater technician at Pensacola State College, left work early on 12 October August 2013. After telling her supervisor she would be taking the rest of the week off as she had some things to take care of. She returned to her home briefly, but was not seen by her housemate, who was on the phone at the time. Eight days later, her car was found in a Pensacola Beach parking lot, with witnesses reporting they saw a man in red shorts get out of the car and open its tailgate on the day it was found. No other trace of her has been found, despite extensive, extensive searches. But based on a description of a woman seen in New Orleans area restaurant who resembled her and had some similar behaviors, her family believes she was abducted and became a victim of human trafficking. <sighs> That's heavy, Doc. Cheeriest uh, episode of Weird Things Yet. Am I right? I mean, that's yeah. it, it, it. These kind of stories, and and again, I'm, I'll refer to Unsolved Mysteries here just because they have their new season on Netflix. But it's it's amazing what happens when you have missing person cases, especially ones that are done under, under mysterious circumstances where you've got a lot of people that uh, they want to believe they really, they desperately want to be like the idea of that woman being a, you know, in human trafficking is a better idea than she was killed or she, you know, died or committed suicide or something like a, that. Dinosaur monster by by a weird spooky gator who uh, the doggy paddles under the waves like, uh, yeah it's 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 nuts. I mean, uh, uh and 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 all uh, sympathy to the families that have to deal with this stuff. Yeah, and sometimes too though, there are circumstances that we don't know, and I I won't I can't say in a case like that, but in other cases you might be like there could be like oh there was a history of drug use and things like that that's not brought yeah. up, and the family might have a reason to think well we think maybe this because that is a weird place to go to to say human trafficking. Yeah, so. yeah, it's um, I mean, but again, when something is truly out of you know at least to the to the family or the investigators out of character, you can't rule anything out. Yeah, yeah. So it is worth reading, and it is a lot of it looked like people who were went you know mountain climbing or in places remote places and sort of just disappeared there. And you know it is some of these places are hard to sort of get to. In some cases, like here's Craig Arnold, an American poet, disappeared after a hike on the Japanese island Kuchinabarujima. He is presumed to have died on a fall from a high cliff, but his body has not been found. So, huh. Yeah. So they're just, it's a very, very freaky, weird, disturbing thing, but weird. Yeah. The, I, yeah. I, I didn't I know like that the they were all ones. compiled like that, though. What an amazing website Wikipedia is. What a, just a brilliant cross section of, 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 of human knowledge. Cause no one would think, like, you would think that those would be in another, you'd have to search for those things regionally. There wasn't just one central repository of everybody 
post Romulus who has gone missing in the world. Yeah, that uh, there is also like some of the interesting stuff too. Like you get some of the 1970s one. So like here's a like 1970 after running out of gas on the Hollywood freeway, Graham was last seen by California Highway Patrol officers on November 15th, 1970. The officer directed her to a callback and later saw her speaking with a man beside her car. The circumstance or disappearance resulted in CHP policies being changed to ensure the safety of stranded female motorists. It's an 18-year-old woman, up and gone. And, you know, one of the things that's not... I haven't seen the new Charles Manson TV series, but one of the things that kind of is uh, talked about Manson was it wasn't just everybody at the Sharon Tate house. It wasn't just some people. There was probably maybe quite a few other murders and stuff and manson probably earlier in his life was involved in some stuff like we don't know the scope so this is the part where we shake it out and move in a new direction right i mean unless <laughs> unless we just want to dive in deeper i mean did i touch a nerve about charles manson uh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> hey hi it's me the guy with a 16 year old daughter <laughs> Ooh. Ah, there we go. There we go. There we go. It's uh uh yeah, a little a little personal. Okay. So, like I was saying, Wikipedia's got a lot of weird stuff in there. Indeed. 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 Let's do some picks. Uh I got a pick. Uh Man, James Cameron's stuff holds up. Like I think universally. We watched The Terminator, Terminator 2. We just watched Aliens. Avatar is Avatar, but but for what it is, it's fine. I think I think next up I'll make my kids watch Titanic, but Aliens. Oh, it really holds up. And uh only only now that I'm, you know, uh, creeping up on 50 years old do I realize that it's the tale of two mothers. It's it's mom on mom battle energy. And it's great. It's way, way good. The tension is great. Everything holds up about it. Uh, Burke uh, uh, should never have gotten that sitcom. It's awesome. <laughs> do, you, do you know? So, do you know the story on how Cameron was able to, how he got to direct Aliens? No. So he had been, you know, he worked for Roger Corman for several years, and then he wrote. Uh, started was writing some screenplays and he became known as a sort of hot screenwriter, you know, up and coming screenwriter in Hollywood. And Sylvester Stallone came to him and said, Hey, I want you to write a sequel to Rambo. And then uh, like Fox went to him and said, Hey, we want you to write a sequel to alien. And he's like, I love alien. I would love to direct the sequel to alien. I'd like to write and direct this for you. And they're like, yeah, yeah, James, that's great. Is it your last credit, Piranha? Ha! Piranha 2, mind you. And so Cameron's like, fine, I'll write this for you. Meanwhile, Cameron had his screenplay Terminator, which he got independent financing for, right? He got the financing he got for Terminator happened. Part of the reason that people decided to back him was they went to the set of like Piranha 2 and they watched James Cameron outside directing. And he's like, okay, you know, lights, camera, action worms and they watch his worms crawled out of the ground because james cameron needed worms to crawl out of that ground for that scene and what he did is he had electrified the ground <gasps> so the worms would come out and all the people the funders the people the people the backers are looking like all we know is he said action worms and the worms came out of the ground like this is our guy he knows what he's doing that is amazing so such a great story he makes Terminator that punches way above its weight. You look at the budget of that movie compared to other budgets and stuff, and what he pulled off, incredible. Terminator comes out, huge success, and Fox is like, you know who'd be a good director for Aliens? <laughs> you, Mr. Cameron. So that's how we got Eric to Aliens, because the success of Terminator, they, he was already writing the screenplay for it, for like, ah, you're a screenwriter, what do you know? When he wrote the screenplays for Aliens and for Rambo 2, he had to basically split his time between he put he had two typewriters set up. One was a screenplay for one, one was a screen for the other, and he would go back and forth between the two. Holy cow. That's awesome. Uh I got a pick. 
uh, Bill and Ted 3, oh, Face the Music. Oh, was it good? I had such a great time with it. Uh, I, oh, cool. I, I, you know, I have such a fondness for that franchise. The thing that I've always loved about it, and really, I love, you know, Excellent Adventure punches above its weight as an idea of like two stoners have 12 hours to not flunk out of school. And it was, it really did it because it had this great societal lens. There's these like side characters like the, you know, Missy who they both had a crush on when she was a senior and they were freshmen that now is married one of their dads, right? Like uh, there's, there's all this, uh, the idea, the identity of like youth culture as not something that is totally wasted, but rather might have this spark is, is very, very pure that then evolves in bogus journey to as like the universe literally expands exponentially. And now we're not just talking about stoners trying to do their homework. We're talking about people in their mid twenties living with the idea that the world exists and heaven and hell and knowledge and stupidity. And, uh, uh, the, the new movie delivers on everything that I've loved about it. The characters are always multidimensional. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the moments there are like laugh out loud moments to me. And it tries to tell, I think a a very challenging story that uh, that the series befits for itself. Like it, it's about youth versus age, and and where these two characters that I think are very unique as youthful, you know, a uh, 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 paragons now, you know, where they do and don't connect with uh, uh, their own impending mortality plus their 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 daughters. So, uh, is it a perfect movie? No. I, and none of them are, but to me, I, I wish we could have gotten, uh, it, it, I, if, if Bill and Ted wasn't, was made at a, at a studio that was still running or that was like picked up, uh, or, or consumed by another larger studio, I feel like we would have gotten five or six Bill and Ted movies by now. And that is a timeline that would be richer and more excellent than ours. Hmm. Uh, I got a pick. Uh, a, a weird one. This is a this is a half-hearted pick because I only watched a little bit of it. I don't know where it's going, and I also don't. I'm one of. I I don't know the original material. Sorry, high school oh, English teachers. Oh. Uh, but uh, I uh was on NBC's Peacock and ended up watching the first two episodes, which are available for free, of Brave New World. Uh, interesting. Very uh, I. I think stop me if this sounds uh, 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 old hat, but kind of a pointed message it seems in Brave New Mo in Brave New World. Um, but I, I think as the, the, if it helps the original source material, the book was not shy about uh, having a message. Yeah, and so um, I. I, I think it makes an interesting mystery if you don't know what's going on. <laughs> so, so, so for for, uh, for whatever reason, you had never read the the just, original. Yeah, just was not on whatever our reading lists had been. Um, so I'm I'm going into it uh, blind. It seems all right. Like I think the 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 three main actors are are pretty good at at um, at showing off the world that they occupy and how they seem to be uh deviations from the norm let's say of the society um i think the idea of the savage lands is interesting and and the way it's represented is is kind of neat um I, I i might i think this might be something i would give the peacock trial for because it's all the rest of them after episode two are in premium so it's not just the ad free you can't just watch them with ads you have to subscribe to peacock so um, I might, I'm, I might check them out. I think it's all right. I, if it doesn't feel like it feels heavy handed in a way that I understand that book to be heavy handed, I guess is what I'd say. I'm so fascinated to, uh, hear how, how it lands with you. Like, like, like if you need, if you need the cash, like I, 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 I want you to con go through the whole experience sure. and let me know if it lands. Yeah, Maybe we'll figure that out. But yeah, uh, yeah, I, I think it's interesting cause it, 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 you know, sets up this very, interesting uh i don't know dynamic of society where everyone is everyone's property and trying to own uh, have a 
family or love is a form of ownership and selfishness and, and theft. And yeah. Yeah. Where, you know, uh, good Christian values of monogamy and love and family are savagery. And so, uh, but then the freedom fighters are, don't seem to be portrayed, let's say in uh, a very favorable light. So I don't know. Uh, the, I'm sure everyone is, everyone at home is like laughing because I don't know what's going on in the story, but uh, I, I, I think it's actually pretty well done. And uh, for Peacock, which uh, is, I'll just say, I don't like their TV app. I don't think it's very good. I think when you watch something and you want to scroll around, I think it sucks. Uh, I think they made a good, they made it an all right show so far. Normally you don't like cock, but. Mm. That's the uh, Brave New World on Peacock. <laughs> Andrew? My pick is, uh, I'm going to, we, we mentioned this, I think last week, but high score. I finished watching all episodes of that and. I enjoyed it, the Netflix documentary about video games. And um, it's a, there are a ton of video game histories out there. There are a ton of them. And and I've seen some criticism like, oh, they should have done this story. They should have done this. Well, that's why there are books like Console Wars. I think the video game, like my favorite book was the one, the, the big, huge uh, video game history or whatever. I think I mentioned before. There's a lot of great stuff out. It is, it's kind of like, Ah, you know, this, this, you know, the six episode thing about the movie industry didn't talk about my favorite movies or whatever. Like, well, it's because they're a lot and video games blew up and it's such a big topic to cover. And I'm sure we're going to get more seasons of it. So I enjoyed it. I liked the way that I liked it. Um, uh, I got, if it was easier for me to get into it than actually the toys that made us, because the toys that made us had this sort of stylish sort of way they did stuff that was a little bit took me a little bit to kind of get into here. I liked the way they sort of, it was sort of the, the moments and stuff were fit around to it. And also the toys that made us is that like, I remember watching Henny interviews and going, I think I know that restaurant. <laughs> and I realized that the production office is here in Burbank. And I'm like, I'd, I'd passed it like every other day. Cause I, I, I'd be watching the interview there. I'd be staring out the window going, I think I know where that is. And then yeah. I'm on Google earth and I'm like, Oh yeah, that's <laughs> just right over here. So, yeah. You know, Google, uh, 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 I, I really have liked High Score from what I've seen, uh, and it is much more of a love letter than Toys That Made Us, which is a little bit more, uh, you know, they they really pit their, their uh, uh, they, they create conflicts of how these things came about, right? And, and Toys That Made Us is often talking about bankruptcies and creative fights and who was right and who was wrong and stuff like that, where this is about, obviously there are stakes, but you are telling a story about an exploding world and whoever you talk to, you are, are, are telling a story that is worth telling and they are kind of pioneers. Uh, I, I I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it so far. I, I, yeah, I love that. I think if you want something deeper, this has been a pick I've had before, which is I think the ultimate history of video games, I think is really, really great in console wars. Uh, both those are great. So, yeah, that's, it's, that's it's like audio book, right? Yeah, they're all in audio. Yeah. Uh, Brian, I would never try to put a dead tree in front of you. Thank I know you. better. Thank <laughs> you. I appreciate that. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that we're at a point now where this is this is very much high score to me feels like a video essay it's just it is like you know a, a it's not a, the exhaustive complete history of video games it is it is very much a a love letter and an essay that is done extraordinarily well yeah and I'll, I'll throw in another pick also by blake j harris who is the author of console wars the history of the future about oculus and facebook it is a extremely in-depth book. And I would argue that like to get a really deep history of Palmer Lucky, who is a young person now who has already made waves in VR. He's one of the reasons why VR kind of accelerated the way it did, because he looked around and said, Oh, we can do these things now. And you get you understand a lot more about his passion for VR and stuff. And then the internal politics of how he got kicked out of of Facebook, and it's one of these things where uh, uh, you know his his political leanings and whatever were part of that. But then the way Facebook handled it, et cetera, is it's a very good overview of this. But you come away at the very he's a very he's very sympathetic. He's just a guy that never even when people are yelling at him because you know Facebook bought Oculus and he's getting death threats and stuff, 
he's like, well, I know what it's like to be a gamer and I know what it's like to be this. And like in the middle of this maelstrom, he is this very sympathetic person. And now he's created this new company, Andrew, which is doing military defense technology, which not without its controversy. And it's going to be interesting to see what happens with that. And so I think if you want to, regardless of what you feel about him, regardless of what you feel about Facebook or whatever, there are people who are shaping things in technology that you, I think, are worth paying attention to and seeing. So I think history of the future, great overview of Oculus, everything that's happening now, you could be like, oh, it's all been foreseen. So I recommend that, really do recommend that book. Right on. So. Nice. Gentlemen, it's been weird. Hey, good show, everybody. Good stuff. All right, we're going to take a few moments and get ready for after things here. Uh, if people need a break, now's the time to go and get ready for that break. Or nice. go take that break. Oh, you take that break. You take that break. You take that break. Have a good weekend, Justin. Uh, I did. I did. Yeah. I um edited together a trailer for an upcoming project very nice very nice i uh cleaned up the studio a little bit mm -mm. um are you uh are you keeping the smoky back room uh set as a, as yeah. a like a b set yeah that'll be the that'll be the the, the night set so on mondays i'm gonna go live during the night um uh to do to watch old debates and we'll oh, just see fine. where that stream kind of evolves yeah. uh but th that'll be the special event set like when a big thing is happening like we'll be either leading up to it or uh doing the the stuff from there yeah. uh we'll i like continue how you have in the, black and white tonight yeah i like uh, but the, it, we'll, the we'll keying it. that you do with the uh, with that whiteboard i think right yeah i think that's that's cool it's like it's 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 a good size for it but you can it's also like uh, and this is not a dig but there's like you can tell it's like a, a yeah. green like a keyed out effect and so it kind of i don't know has an interesting look when you can yeah. lean into that well because it feels as close as that's going to feel to it being a projector Ah, and that yeah. and that really fits with the aesthetic is that like i don't care if there's a little shadow on it that's creating distortion oh, yeah because it looks about as much as people who didn't grow up with projectors um you know like it so uh, uh yeah no it almost like people have often thought it uh, uh, that it looked like uh an effect like a grainy effect i was putting on it Nice. But, uh, but yeah, no. So we'll be watching the 1960 debate between Kennedy and Nixon tonight. Uh, obviously, anybody who listened to the first season of Raise the Dead know I have a lot to say about that. Um, and uh, uh, I think it's going to be really, really fun. I will guarantee you that anybody who watches it will leave with a very pedantic uh, party killing conversation in your back pocket. Whenever anybody brings up debates over the next few weeks, mm -hmm. you will be able to, um, you will be able to kill any vibe uh, by <laughs> mentioning these pedantic points that I'm going to bring up about the Kennedy versus Nixon uh, 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 debate tonight. So weird. I, uh, there's, there's a, there's um if you have a podcast, there's a website out there that will just kind of unsolicited tell you like, Hey, we're charting your, your, uh, your podcast. Yes. Um, and so I've just been informed that trending lemon is down to number 114 in Pakistani comedy. Mm. Damn. Oh. Bryce, you're huge in Karachi, baby. <laughs> well, apparently I'm down. Apparently I'm down. No, I mean, I mean, that's, Every setback is a setup for a comeback. Yeah. Um, uh, I I had a good weekend. Uh, a friend of uh, a fr friend of the 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 stream in the studio, Trey Warren. Um, yeah. He uh, he he's letting me borrow. Uh, there's a the, there's a you know these um, button pads for like music, right? And so it's like a yeah. big eight by eight. Yeah. Ba -da, ba -da, ba -da, ba -da. yeah. Exactly. So they make a very very nice one called Push. And uh, he's letting me borrow uh, his, and uh, I don't know. I I had spent 
a couple of hours just putting together a little music loop or whatever and uh it was it was fun i had not made music in uh even just toying around like that pretty much since trending lemon went on hiatus uh and so it was it was fun to do that so that's i saw i saw you on social posting oh yeah know, i posted just, a little yeah, link. meter stuff that was that was uh, bryce back in the lab yeah yeah and uh so that was that was kind of nice and and it's like because it's like it's its own like whole computer it's got a whole huge screen and it's got a million knobs and it plugs into the software that i use really specifically so there's a lot of stuff i don't even know about how it works but it was it was a lot of fun and uh um i certainly have things i would like to work on including music stuff um in the future so once we kind of wrap up this modern road crunch time um yeah i would like to have that be something i dedicate get a little back more time to. get back into it yeah um you should man you're you're really really talented at it oh, and, thank you. uh uh you know i think you've you, you still have an audience that is very very pumped they want yeah. to hear more stuff you know i was um playing i was playing an online game with uh, uh with some of the dkg crew and uh uh someone had mentioned uh, someone i had not talked to in, in a while had mentioned oh yeah i still listen to uh i still listen to your album i was like oh that's really nice so uh it's a good uh, album yeah thank you i know every 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 like three or four months i go back and listen to it i'm just like oh yeah i used to i because i think once you have some time away from it all of the edges and details start to fuzz out yeah. and and it just makes me go like oh well you know maybe that was a little formulaic or whatever and then you realize it like oh no man like i i actually did put a good like a lot of care into it yeah um, which it maybe sounds weird um from the yeah, outside this is mercury this is mercury rising mercury is counter. that on all the uh mercury counter right yeah it's, uh, is that is that on all the the streams the streaming uh services it is it is i want to i also i made um that's actually my second album i made an album in college a double album that i've not put up for i think it's only on my band camp um yeah but i should now that i i've I've had DistroKid forever, so it's cost me literally nothing to post it. So um, I should just put that up somewhere so people can listen to that too. Yeah. Oh, totally. And uh, you know, look, the world needs more music. Yeah. And I, uh, you know, and also I don't know, you know, whether or not it's worth it, but like I've been using this like artless service a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know what the what what the point of or what the 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 sale stuff is. If there's like other just music that you just feel is like good mood stuff, like that's literally like all I look for. It's just like, all right, I need to sort. I need a creepy rock beat. Yeah. I need a happy jazz song. I need a like. And and when I'm doing that, I use that for PX3 all the time as just like intros outros i wonder how much mm. that pays because i really i use the crap out of it yeah i have um i've had that similar i've had a similar thought about that um but i've never done any investigative research on how yeah to get onto something like that because if, if it was like something like pond five or something like you can that's just a marketplace you can just make an account and post your stuff and yeah. Post stuff yeah um but there is something nice about those those music subscription services um and yeah artless is like super cool i don't know uh in, similar music mind. bryce music bryce uh, we, we 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 all seek the return of music <laughs> bryce uh, andrew uh, i have no musical talent why do you have to rub it in bryce no, I, I can't even remember lyrics why bryce every phone. single time I was going to ask if you were having problems with your AirPods. I noticed you were futzing with them in the show. Uh, no, it was like one with had a low charge. I realized one oh. hadn't charged. And then once I let it charge for a bit, I think let me check now. Gotcha. So, yeah. Um, I ordered, I ordered, a, a wireless gamer headset. Oh, really? Yeah. So I'll, I'll be, you know, because I use, I use, I use just air, uh, not AirPods, earbuds, ear, earpods, the little wired earbuds when I do the streams and stuff, but those are really short. Um, and this one has like a detachable mic and it's wireless. So I could move around if I need to. Um, 
So I think that'll come in tomorrow or Wednesday. Um, but yeah, or even even just as wireless headphones, they're supposed to sound they're they're the wire cutter pick for wireless. Yeah. Uh, what else is going on? What else is going on? Uh, night attack tomorrow. That'll be pretty fun. Um, do we have a Do we have a guest? I, I I will not be streaming right beforehand, so I will I will be fresher, and the show will be on time, which is good. Uh, we we were going to, and then we just uh, that person just had a family emergency, so that person oh, will be on no. next week. Um, okay. but we may we may try and scrounge up someone. Oh, you know what? I just got an email from a from a friend of the show who asked me for a favor and then also said he wants to be on the show so uh maybe tune in tomorrow maybe we'll find out we'll and find says out. which headset oh that's a very good question it is uh um paper trail Amazon. oh see they don't put your receipt they don't put your whole order in the in your email anymore because they don't want google to have that information on you <laughs> It's so weird. It's true this though. Hey, the the hey email. Just Amazon. When when you order something from Amazon, it doesn't list what you bought anymore in those emails. What? Yeah. Check it. Oh. Check check a look. Uh, so I <laughs> ordered the HyperX Cloud Flight S. Cloud Flight S. Something. Uh, meant for SM says AirPods have good microphones. My quality is the issue with small headphones, not sound quality. I will. I really. I like my AirPods, but I. I feel like if there is any fidelity element to it, it gets completely eaten when I'm on the phone. Right? Like, you get on the phone with someone and that's like 32 kilobits per second. It's like you know, phone. Phone, digital phone technology has not um, upgraded, which is super weird. Unless you do like FaceTime audio or Google yeah. Call. Maybe it's called Google Call. Um, where's our another hand? That's cool. Oh, we, you know, we had a guest. He might be saying goodbye to the guest. Mm. Had a good stream on, uh, on Friday. We played uh, Threads of Fate. An, an old a 20 year old now rpg uh we finished it and uh so let me toss it to you justin yeah so this is it's an interesting game because it has two main characters and so you pick which story you want to do and they play very differently yeah. but we already but the story doesn't change very much between the two characters even though they play very differently and they focus on different parts of the story okay but if I do, if we do it again with the other character, then that's going to be about three weeks to kind of do that whole thing again to see kind of that payoff. And I'm I'm still unsure of if we want to spend the next three weeks doing I that. I would say. So have you already played? No, you're playing through it the first time we, right now, right? Uh, we just fin this this last Friday was our second week doing it, and we just finished it. But that was a okay. that had to be a six hour stream because I kept feeling like we were close to the end, and we were not. And also, it's not voiced, so I'm having to do character. Vo I'm doing. I'm just. I'm reading aloud, which affects things. Um, if your audience is not banging down the door for it, <laughs> don't. Okay. Like here's here's my thoughts on stuff like that. Yeah. If the audience is crazy for it, then you will know that they are crazy for it. If they are like, whatever you want, mm. then that means that like, I don't know, I could go for it. Then don't do it because you'd rather get people that are like, oh, we should do blah, blah, blah. We should go back to blah, blah, blah. And if people really want it, trust me, they'll ask for it. Mm. Like, you know, so That's just advice. just move. Just just do another thing. Good advice. Especially if it's mostly the same stuff anyway. It's so weird. Like, um, it's, it's very, it's like, I think at the time there were not a lot of games that were doing that of like, here are two very different characters. Cause it's kind of actiony. So here are two very yeah. different characters, but you could, I could tell knowing how the story goes now of like, Oh, why are you, why did you not like just say that this is how that person died? And it's like, why are like these two characters uh, yeah. like don't even like each other let alone spend any time with each other but you get enough of it where it's like do we really need to spend 10 hours so that we can see 
who killed this person and a slightly different ending where that person comes back to life. Like it feels mm. like a gimmick. I mean, in, in an era, especially what you said, it came out like around 2000, 99, 2000. Yeah. When they were like, that's pumping a, them out. That's at a point where there's a lot of saturation in the market and the, and like prices are still really high for stuff. And so it's like the idea of gameplay, you know, extension. Yeah. Uh, you know, I remember because even what Sonic and Knuckles did that too, where you got the cartridge that you could plug the other cartridges into, and now it was like, oh, I get to play as Knuckles in Sonic One and Sonic Two and stuff like that. Yeah, and which like, is such a that's, crazy idea. That's all, that's really cool. But yeah. I mean, yeah, it was a really it was a rad it was a rad concept, and um, it made me dust off Sonic One and Sonic Two. Like, and so now I don't, I, I don't feel like an idiot in a way that oftentimes at that point, you know, in a, you know, now it's like you have triple A titles that are like really good, but often it's like, even if they suck, they eventually get good. And, and you know, there's a lot of money put into them. Mm -hmm. uh, back then, man, you spend, you know, 30 to $50 on a game and it just might be trash. <laughs> like, it's yeah. just like word doesn't spread. You got to wait until you, I mean, do you wait until you read it in Game Pro to see if it sucks? And it's like, oh, it's short or it's stupid. Um, At least now all those games are like on Steam, but they're usually fairly cheap. Yeah. Comparatively than, you know, cartridge uh, titles. They're, uh, um, so they, God, I, got, there is, I, I wrote up an email for the video game newsletter and then I did not send it out over the weekend like I wanted to, but mm -hmm. um. There uh, is an artist, uh, uh, or excuse me, uh, an article um, on Kotaku saying like, hey, let's just delay the next generation of video game consoles because all of the games have been delayed. All of the yeah. all of the games are delayed other than the small indie titles that are going to be on other consoles. I mean, Halo, Halo got delayed into 2021, and that is a linchpin of uh, Microsoft's even just Microsoft's Game Pass strategy. So it's like, do you, I guess you tell, if, if you think of it utilitarian, like, like just get it out there and then people have it and you ease some of the launch issues that come with trying to get everyone getting the thing that's really hot at once. But a weak launch is also like not good and having but no I games would, is also bad. <laughs> but I would also presume that a lot of the question for them is what is this ecosystem? Where do people buy it? Like, you know, if, if, you know, game stops are, are less of a, a thing or people don't make, you know, we have no idea where, where the national mood on retail is going to be. We have no idea where malls are going to be. We have no idea where all these places that normally midnight Walmart's, launches and yeah, midnight launches. We have no, like we're moving into a world that I'll tell you what, in a year, we might wind up looking a lot like we did a year and a half ago, but maybe we don't. And those you things know, are once every six year decisions. And part of it too is is kind of the pipeline is that like there's people whose jobs are to make stuff, and if you say hey we're gonna put a hold on this, mm -hmm. then that means you don't start this next thing in the pipeline, and it may mean pink slips for people. Yeah, you know that's you know big problem like like entertainment industry here is that like you know when you freeze production on stuff and shows and stuff, it you know, pushes stuff around. Yeah, oh for sure. As yeah, like, and people it, leaving industries too. You know, people all of a sudden going, you know, go do something else. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's such a weird time. It's a it's a really weird time. And then, you know, there's a lot of ideological differences now between these consoles in a way that there hasn't been in maybe a decade or so. There's a lot of non traditional ideas in uh, in this stuff. Okay, Brian says to go and start without him. Okay. Yeah. Things we could have known ten minutes ago. Uh, <laughs> I agree. Uh, do we? Uh, what, what, what will we talk about? Yeah, Bryce, you were about to say we're going to talk about. Uh, I mean, we can. I mean, I can talk about video game stuff all all damn day. Uh, no, it was about uh, pricing. They've got they're doing weird pricing and cross generational stuff, but I yeah. don't know if that's after things. Well, let's come. talk about the future of play. Future play. Okay, we can do that. Uh, let me see. I think I got a three shot of us here. Uh, uh, uh. 
Now we'll just do this. Use okay, that's gonna be yeah. all right. Here we go. You ready to do this? Yo. Oh yeah. All right, we're getting started in three, two. Hello and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. That's me. Gentlemen, I just noticed the react button here. I'm going to send a bunch of stars into this. <laughs> into the Skype so, chat? Yeah. Yeah, it's just I want you guys to know how I feel. Oh, good. <laughs> um, <laughs> we are watching the gamification of everything now. Like... Uh, I love the fact that for a Skype chat, we now have hearts. So, well, gentlemen, I'm going to print in, present you with the TD Bank International Conglomerate Funds third quarter financial reports from the Northern District of Canada here. Beep, 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 heart, 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 heart. And the cry, yeah. crying, laughing emoji. Crying, laughing emoji. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. Like I use Slack now, and like that's the sort of thing where, you know, it, emojis are great because, like, Somebody says a thing. I'm like, I don't have words. Thumbs up. Problem yeah. solved. Yeah. Yeah. We, we use that. That happens a lot. And it's a, it's a very weird behavior. Cause I think people are of two minds of it. Like, uh, w when I confirm that I got an, in a piece of information, right. I'll send back a message saying, got it. Or, okay. You know, gotcha. Yeah. But some people on the staff will send just a react, like a little check Mark react. And, mm -hmm. That checkmark react doesn't like ping me, which I think is very considerate, right? Like you don't want to like buzz my phone again. Ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. Yeah. And it just says, okay, got it. But sometimes I need that science. Sometimes I need that proof of life. Sometimes I do need to know that, you know, something was received. Um, so I think that's one of the weird, like, uh, I don't know, social functions of digital communication nowadays. Like well, how and do you bug someone to say yes or, you know, confirm? Yeah. And, and that's the thing is for where we are now, where digital communication is so much more important than it has been as so many businesses are working remotely, uh, is the shifting paradigm of what we expect from each other. What is business communication? Like Slack, I do think feel like has kind of changed that uh, uh, sort of forever. Like this is this is, you know, now something that is, omnipresent less formal uh than let's say an email would be uh mm -hmm. and and yet can often get like particularly uh granular like you know you, people get, get into side chats and side groups and everything that like i've heard from friends can oftentimes get you know kind of Nasty. Go gossipy right? right like or like like now it has replaced all these functions that used to be something that was physical and i think the informality is is a a part of it in that we're not treating it like we would treat like a fax machine or or a or even email it's it's kind of uh kind of fascinating it is a very interesting thing to see that every time we think about the future when you watch movies and stuff and part of it's the idea of just sort of streamlining to make things easier is like Oh, there's the game that we play in the future, or there's the form of communication, or is the it's this, but like right now we're doing Skype. I'll have a Google Hangout meeting later, and then I use Slack to talk to people, and then I've got text messages here, and then I've got email, and then oh, I have a phone that sometimes people call me on, and you know, we're getting more things, not fewer, which is interesting. And should should be good right i mean it should be good that there are lots of different options out there for different things right i think of all of those different forms and i think well okay well, you know like all of the different things i've used over the past week right like okay well i use discord to kind of have a casual hangout with with friends kind of drop in drop out and a zoom call to have a more formal hang out with with people you know you have email for uh, like you know we need you know confirmation paper trail and all that stuff slack for for work stuff and and i i guess it's it would I, it's overwhelming i think if you're not familiar with it i'm mm -hmm. i'm i'm in it i'm deep in it i'm down in the trenches of the water um and so i know exactly what application is for what use but i imagine if if you are 
even partially a, a, a tech luddite, it, there's a lot and it's confusing. And yeah, I could, yeah, I could imagine for somebody having to kind of immerse into that. And, and I, and I was just sort of saying, like, I wasn't kind of making a criticism of all the stuff and sort of an observation that we often come up with more granular tools and not the tool. And, you know, one of the things we wanted to talk about for this episode was the future of like gaming and stuff. And the idea that, um, we are in 2020 and I've got, you know, oh. a, a de- you know, a device hey. that's a, a knockoff of the form factor of the Game Boy, mm-hmm. but because it's 2020, you buy this off of Amazon, and there comes a 400 games, which I don't know if that's legal. Almost <laughs> but certainly there's not. Like, <laughs> but it's like it's a but you know Amazon's choice. I'm like I'll buy this thing, and I'm like oh, I don't know if this is this seems like uh, you know, but it's fascinating that like you know for 15 dollars you get an amazing Game Boy type clone with the mini PC and everything else inside of there, but it's 2020 and people still love these little handhelds and those little classic games. Yeah. And nobody's going, Oh, I like to play antique games. Oh, what's that? No, people know, people know what a joystick is. They know what a 2600 looks like. They know what these things are. They know what breakout is, you know, people where, you know, we don't sit around calling rock music. Oh, classical music. You know, like, no, it's yeah. rock. It's, you know, seventies era rock, which people still listen to. Yeah. At least, at least oh, not yet, right? I mean, well, but I think that's the thing that that the future the future is this idea of like uh, I had this observation twenty years ago. Like I went to go do swing dancing back when that was a thing that dorks like me would go do, and I'm like, this is kind of interesting because I'm like, I knew there was like a period like ten years before that like older people would do it, and this was sort of a thing, and I don't know if it's I'm sure it's still around somewhere. You know, and I'm like, how interesting is this that this is still a thing because it comes back and there's value here and it's sort of a neat social thing. And that was where I sort of thought that like, oh, things don't go out of style. Things, yeah. things, things will be, yeah, the permanence here. Like, yeah, they see you know, Star Trek Beyond called Beastie Boys classical music. Like, yeah, that's always the joke in futuristic movies, like rock, oh, classical music. I'm like, no, we, we go, yeah, that's 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 rock, that's this. And you you listen to yeah, there was that big thing like uh, it made waves in some of the some, on the Twitter was uh, these kids listening to Bill Collins in the air tonight. You know? <laughs> yeah. It, no. Yeah. It, it shot up. It was like like in the air tonight, like charted because uh, that went viral and and people were like, "Wow, this dude's got it." Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I saw I'd seen those those kids a couple months before when they uh, listened to uh, Dolly Parton's Jolie. You know? Yeah. And you know, if you like music, you like good music, you know, you like good music. And that was sort of thought was sort of interesting. Was it like, you know, if you have taste, you have taste, you don't just say, well, my taste is from this period to this period. I mean, if you're, you know, that nerd you are. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, I, I, I think from a creator's perspective, right. We, we were talking a little bit, um, uh, uh, in between the shows here that like, you know, I, I made that album a few years ago and, uh, every so often I go back and listen to it because in my head, all of the details and all of the, all of the little extra, I don't know, all the facets of it get shaved down and, and rounded out. And I, and in my head it goes, Oh, well that's just, you know, that was just a thing, but then you kind of re experience it. And, uh, and it feels like, Oh, actually, yeah. Like a, I did, a, a lot of time did go into this. And I think that happens with, I think the function of, of nostalgia a little bit, um, just you know remind remembering like oh this wasn't this isn't bad because it's outdated i've just forgotten about it and it actually you know it still took a lot of time to make or a lot of ingenuity creativity yeah Yeah, we forget how much we care and and like when you go look at old nintendo games you you go back and look at mario and you look at this and like man what they thought about doing and the attention to things were there and it shows to this day and sometimes you realize that some things that today could use some other great things today, but some things could use a little bit more love and attention, you know, because it's often just easy to say, Oh, let me just drop this thing in here, do this thing in here. And boom, my game's ready. Where when you're working at such limited resources and you have to stand out from everything else. Mm-hmm. You know? Well, that's, you know, something that I, I think is fascinating about some of the, like, you know, the steam marketplace and the rise of indie games on mobile is that there really kind of was this idea of like returning to the basics of like, Hey, what's just good gameplay. Cause we're yeah. never going to be able to compete at the level of graphics or rendering or voice acting or mocap or whatever. But 
you can still have a great gameplay and and you can still kind of outthink uh uh you know triple a games or big titles by by what you plan on doing with it and and even in in a meta sense like bryce's obsession with the with the blaze ball game or whatever <laughs> like there is a there there is such a fascinating both in physical and digital games such a fascinating re-examining as the bar fell like to for the tools now almost anybody can at least get started doing one of those two things making a digital game making a physical game it now became like no let's evolve on the gameplay mechanics or let's evolve on fun like that was something that really went into contender and action news for me was like what's fun like what makes you want to yell at your friends like like what what how can we how can we make this moment and that's something that i i think uh because of the necessity of building games uh had kind of been lost for a little bit or at least didn't have any as many players there uh yeah. there was a delightful moment and i was so so proud of penny who's now 16 years old she's uh acting dungeon master in our D D campaign and uh i for the life of me do not remember how we ended up here but we ended up in some kind of America's Got Talent reality uh, live stage show competition. So uh, uh, I found myself unironically calling uh, uh, Matt Donnelly and asking him for a reminder of what the structures of the triple threat, uh, apparently there are four to the triple threat, uh, four types of jokes were. And last night we spent three hours doing nothing but telling jokes in four structures and then rolling dice uh uh uh, uh the difference between blank and your mom uh 107 blanks walk into a bar uh a uh, uh oh i'm gonna forget because there are four um uh, uh they call me the blank because i blank and then um uh I, i've lost the last one but like having that excuse to give uh, that structure to everything and to see everybody jump in and it didn't matter if they did good or bad because you know we're going to roll dice and that determine whether or not the crowd approved or didn't approve or not uh but it but it, it was it was it was really a remarkable experience i like the fact that it's 2020 and people still roll dice to play games <laughs> yeah <laughs> it matters <laughs> and i would say now more than ever you know, now the, the the explosion of Dungeons and Dragons as a mainstream form uh, of of contemporary art is is remarkable. It is it is one of uh, the most amazing elements of of I think our modern culture. I, I when I was playing in Rec Room the other day, and I've thought about this before, of like it would be kind of fun to put on your VR helmet, sit down and be in front of a big game board. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and do, let, instead mm -hmm. of me playing a fantasy quest video game, let me pay, play the really coolest version of Dungeons and Dragons in VR, where we can be in a forest and we can look like characters and stuff, but we're still moving little characters around and stuff because it's that, that social sort of kind of environment. And I think that, I think that's one of the things that, we talked about in the, in the uh, Weird Things episode, Facebook has horizons, and I played in Rec Room. One of the problems there is locomotion, is that we try to recreate these big spaces, which look cool in video, but when you're there and you got to get from here to there, you either got to click your joystick and sort of just drag yourself through there or teleport. And both of them get tedious for a while because we're trying to recreate three-dimensional space when we're sitting, you know, we're standing in a six-by-six -six sort of environment and walking around is a pain in some of the best experiences I've had in VR. Sometimes when people have scaled things down to fit down on your desk, like there's uh Moss is a really cool VR game. Have you seen this? Mm -mm. It's the one with the, this, you control a little mouse ru running around. And so you're basically looking at like a diorama of this character. So you can sit down and watch it and you can see as you try to solve puzzles. And I love the idea of like, let's take, sometimes the, the VR version, the virtual version doesn't have to be, and it's for real. It's sometimes like, no, it's just the cool thing about this. So, uh, yeah, this is on PlayStation. It's on Oculus. Uh, there's this little mouse that you control. And then basically 
you are stationary and you can pick up the mouse and controller and tell her where to go. And yeah, but, you're always in a fixed kind of camera position. So it's yes, it's yeah, you're looking down on the, on the space rather than first person. Yeah. yeah, you don't have to stand up and walk around and do it. You just sort of sit there and look at it, and because it works, because she's a mouse, so she's small, so you're looking down at this little tiny little world. And so I think you know that's one of the things I think about is just how much how we because Brian we started talking off talking a bit about like how much things didn't change. Like we don't, we don't call rock music now classical music. It's rock. It's, you know, you, you, you have a genre, you pick a, de a decade, you can be 15 years old and you can be the biggest Led Zeppelin fan in the world. Right. And nobody thinks that you're a weirdo. Right. Uh, it's, it's, it's bottled up. Uh, it has a label. That's the thing. And, and, and whether it's older, like, like, um, boy, that's a weird thing too, is like, uh, when we were growing up, if you were 17 years old and loved vinyl, big band music you you would get some looks but but that's gone now where like yeah. now it's like oh you have chosen this to be your bubble to play around in and uh i don't know part of me finds that kind of wonderful that that that, oh, that, that we're all tolerant of it yeah i i see i i always sort of like i kind of have my count the led zeppelin t-shirts and they're always on teenagers they're always on teenagers and and you know, their experience with that band isn't much different than my own. I, I started listening to Led Zeppelin long after they broke it up and Bonham, John Bonham had died, you know, but I saw, oh, I love this sort of thing. And I see a kid today who listens to this and their experience is just as genuine as my own. And that's the thing I think about, you know, is that uh, they wear the shirt like, yeah, cool. You know, it was like seeing Joy Division shirts decades after, you know, Joy Division was no longer a band. Oh, and yeah. He's got to go. Um, it makes me think of, and, and maybe this will be my pick, but, uh, the diamond age by, uh, Neil Stephenson, you know, he talks mm -hmm. about like entire strata of society that have just, uh, mutually agreed upon like, Hey, we're all going to be Victorians and, uh, other strata are like, we're going to be, uh, uh, I don't know, Kung Fu artists or whatever. Uh, it's, it's, uh, in a post singularity world where you can have anything you want, you kind of get to decide how you want to live. Yeah, my I love that book. I think it's a great pick. But my my issue is sort of like that that it becomes a twenty four seven thing. It, it to me, it's like rent fairs. It's a thing you do on the weekends. It's not a way of life you really want. Yeah, and and it you know it made you know Stevenson is a guy who probably would live in a rent fair year round as long as he had computer <laughs> access. Probably but, has. Yeah, uh, I was sort of my thing about that idea of like, no, like, I think the mutability of identity is really sort of the interesting thing is the idea that I go into this space, and I'm going to be this personality in this way. And then, oh, it's five o'clock. I'm going to go be that you look at look what happens at, you know, Comic Con and Dragon Con and stuff, different costume each day, right? You know, it, yeah. it is a different not I'm going to show up and be one character throughout like, no, I'm going to share my love of this, my love of this and my love of this. If I, if I remember correctly, the justification in this particular book was that um, from the thousand yard view, it looked as though that was a uh, structure that would uh, fairly consistently provide a certain level of happiness. And and mm. uh, and that's why they did it. I, Again, read read the book. It's 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 worth it. Stevenson. It's Stevenson is great. Yeah, it's a good book. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So somebody no, go ahead. Well, I just said somebody commented like you hear people refer to classic rock referring to the fifties and sixties. Classic rock, though. We don't just say classical music, like yeah. the sci-fi joke. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, although I, you know, I've I've heard of i don't know if i've ever caught it because i don't know exactly how much classic rock i listen to especially now that i don't own a car and don't travel anymore but uh i have heard 90s songs played on classic rock radio stations or i've heard of this i've heard of nirvana on stations that used to only play uh led zeppelin and then they played van halen and now they play alice in chains so there i think there is an element at least in that field but yeah it is rock music we are here for like they're not going to mix it in on npr you know yeah we're, we're we're talking a little bit about kind of the lasting uh, uh the, the lasting uh force of these creative works do do any of the three of you go back and and listen or read or watch any of your old uh old works 
I'm scared to like, I know they'll always be there and I know they will always be as either schadenfreudelicious or as surprisingly good or as inspiring as they're ever going to be. And none of that's going to change. So as a result, like I regard it as it's, it's gold in a vault. So, so I, I sort of intentionally like the only way to ruin it is to peak too early. It's gold, Brian. It's literally gold in a vault. Mm. I mean, something. I mean, it's like I, I'm going to get something out of it. I'm going to mine it somehow. Oh, God, I just, I was just... <laughs> Mine is uranium in a vault, Brian. <laughs> but, yeah. but, 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 but you get my point, right? Like, like oh, whatever, yeah, yeah. What, whatever it is, like that belongs in a time when I feel empty and I need help. And oh, so today. Uh, I'm sorry. That was mean. Uh, uh I, I I didn't know I was performing so poorly. Uh, but no, 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 no. I'm sorry. But, no, I'm no, sorry. But, 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 I was projecting. Uh, it's it, it, but it's one of those things where it's like um, I know it will always be there. So I have a tendency to always figure out an excuse to, you know, soon, soon, I, not not I, now. Does that soon. does that affect your perception of? of those works over time. Like I mentioned, like the, the fuzziness of, of that stuff in the past. Um, I intentionally don't revisit the past very much. We've, we've talked about this. I have no affinity for, uh, 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 those feelings. Um, because I know that every time you revisit a memory, you're corrupting it. And so as a result, I, I, I tend to, try to stay dialed in in the moment i don't have brian's theory on why i don't revisit the past but i don't revisit the past i'm not nostalgic i'm not like i just i don't go back and reread my books i don't do any of that if you walked into my place you would not know that a that i was a magician or that i was an author you just you're not going to see i mm. get these plaques every time like i reach some new sales record for my book and little trophies and stuff I just don't. Interesting. Just... That's interesting because like, like all those trophies go straight on the wall for me because I understand they're not there for me. They're, uh, they're there for whoever is walking into the house for the first time, or maybe, maybe to some part there for me as a reminder of, Hey, if nothing else, you did this. I I did in my townhouse in Florida, I did put up a wall of all my books and videos. And the reason was, was to remind myself because it was in my, my on the landing between the first floor and the second floor to remind myself what I do for a living. It was just this sort of thing because I'd be doing so many different projects. And I said, I need to put this thing in front of me. So every time I walk by, there's missing spots. and I know I got to make a thing, but I just I never I'm just not a nostalgic person. I say as I hold a Rubik's Cube next to a Game Boy. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think for me, it's a reminder of who I'm supposed to be for everybody who walks into this house. You know, like, like, like I walk in and I'm like, oh, that's right. This is who I need to be for everybody who comes in. Um, I don't know. What about you, Justin? Um, you know, I, I'm more on the side of not putting up uh, achievement stuff. Uh, I have my own bizarre, uh, personal thoughts on, on whether or not I am motivated or unmotivated at the moment by realizing that I have any kind of talent, <laughs> uh, in terms of listening to stuff, if it's not mechanical, like, uh, you know, I've listened to back to raise the dead and to crystal. Um, I, uh, I, I don't in general, but I've, I've done that recently just to kind of try to make sure that the lessons I've learned or maybe to relearn lessons that I've forgotten by reminding myself of them. Uh, but that's to try to make the next thing better. And uh, it, everything's kind of in service to going forward. That's, that's the big thing for me is, is that if, it's, uh, if it ain't about what's next, then what about it? Yeah, I, 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 I suppose... That's why I do put that stuff up is because um, there are new people who enter my life and it's important that I remind myself of who they expect me to be. 
and uh, or who they've seen me as up until this point and 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 who I'm representing in their mind you know and and uh, if 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 I'm not that anymore then fine we can fix that but but it's important that I know that I remind myself like somebody is here because their dad brought them because they happen to have a convention in San Antonio and they drove out to HQ and it was a 40 minute drive and and it's 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 like I I owe I already owe them something and it I I think it's worthy to be reminded of what that is. No, I I I hear you. Like I part of me is like I've never been happy where I'm at. I'm always trying to think of where I am. I haven't said oh I'm a thing. Like you you have an identity around you know the YouTuber and podcaster and stuff like this. I've never been happy with whatever my present identity was, whether it was magician or even novelist. I was never like oh well this is me. When I worked for the amazing Randy. You know, there was the Randy show when he would get a visitor to his foundation, a visitor to where he worked or whatever. There was a show there. There was the awards. There was everything. This is this is the presentation. And that was powerful. But that was that was the narrative as you went to go visit Randy and then Randy would bring you to the library. Randy would show you around. He'd maybe do a trick for you and whatever. And it was this very and it's like David Cop Copperfield with this museum. There's the David show. You know, right. that's what happens when you go see David. And I've, I've met other celebrities, too. Like you go to their house. And there's the show of who they are, and this is what they do, because it's just so much of it is either something from having to entertain reporters or people or the expectation on them. And I always thought that was kind of a very interesting sort of phenomena that I've just watched independently in several different places. Do you, do you think it's inherently good or bad? or um... Oh, for the people visiting, it's great, Brian. The fact that when somebody goes to visit you and they get it, they get they get the Brian experience. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you I, I, I do, do you feel like the things that we've been talking about the last five or ten minutes feel are something that keep you stuck in a rut though, right? I mean, if if like Brian, for example, you said, Well, I don't go back and watch my old stuff. I really don't have like a longing for nostalgia, but also you're describing a world where you are keeping yourself to the memory of those things and also not reliving them. Um, I, like you're becoming uh, a facsimile of a facsimile at some point. If you, if that goes on long enough, right? Uh, let me, let me try this on for size. I don't know if this will land or not, but it's like, uh, there's an asymmetry where it's like folks who show up here, they have either one year, five years, 10 years, 20 years of, of previous backstory of who they think I am and what we are. Um, I am not beholden to be those things from the past, but I am beholden to help them feel as good as possible for their investment that they've made for these past one year, five year, 10 years, 20 years. Uh, and so if I could do that by hanging some memorabilia on the walls, uh, and then also do the thing that I, I personally feel like is important, which is engage with them fully and say, where are you at? What can I do to help you? Then that seems like the best of both worlds. That's, that's what I try to aim, aim for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. What do you picks? Yeah. Uh, uh, the vow. Still watching that vow, man. They're vowing the hell out of things over there in Nixium. And uh, uh, in all seriousness, I thought that this is a this is a our modern world of uh, uh, serialized documentaries are such that they tend to go on too long. In my opinion, there's even the really, really big and famous ones. I think could probably be shorter by an episode or two. Um, this initially gave me those vibes but i like the pacing that they are taking with this particular story and uh, i felt that this episode was a great way to kind of get us into some of the more dark elements of this uh, uh self-help group slash community slash cult um by explaining they just dedicate an entire episode to what happens when you realize and how long are you willing to delude yourself? How 
much are you willing to trust everybody um or trust the voices that are are lying to you how much evidence do you need and then once you flip that bit uh how do you even process how much damage you've let go by because you were connected and i thought that was not only a great story to be told about um cults and stuff like that because it is an often often uh, told uh, in that context but also in a lot of our lives you know there are there are lessons to be learned so in watching it so far what would be the advice uh, theoretically if somebody was trying to start their own self-help movement cult slash maybe sex thing to not get caught Hang on. But, yeah, I'm gonna grab a pen. Oh wait, you're already doing the gag. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, um, boy, uh, you know, some people just. I bet you Tony Robbins gets laid a lot. Like it's all I'll say. Some people just need to go that extra mile. Like I think you know, uh, uh, and then that's what that's what gets you in trouble. A lot of what they do. Like, you know, is is much like Scientology to a certain point. People, even people who leave Scientology say that they still practice by some of the tenets because it did help them. There's a reason why they were in it to begin with. There is something that they got from it. Uh, but man, when these cult of personalities get really cult of personality, mm, you better wonder who's at the top of that org. Yeah. That's the thing. I remember when I was reading a lot about cults when I was younger and, and you know, Scientology, all these, I was just fascinated by it. And I had this sort of epiphany one day. The problem with cults, you know, besides the evil part and the, you know, ruining people's lives part, once you get past that, the problem when you create a cult is you're surrounded by people who fell for it. Yes. And you want to have a conversation with somebody. You're having a conversation with somebody who has been, you've brainwashed, you know. So, what did you think of the expanse last night? I don't know, leader. What did, what did I think about the expanse last night? You know, mm. like, oh, did I like it? Oh, geez, come on. What do you think about this? Story? How about the Batman trailer? What do you think of the Batman trailer? Yeah, the Batman trailer. What do we think? <laughs> and it's kind of boring after a while. I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, you know. There's there's a lot there's a lot in there. I would encourage everybody to watch it. Uh, I don't know how many how many episodes it's going to go, but uh, you know I thought that they, they did an effective job of kind of laying out the story, and it helps that one of the guys that left that is a central character was shooting documentaries for Nexium, and so they have just the mother load of all footage and B roll. There's not really a moment that even if they need to recreate it. Uh, that they can't use file footage that effectively kind of recreates this moment in time. Uh, and then spoiler alert, uh, as things break down, people start recording each other's phone calls. And so they also have a wealth of actual recordings, high fidelity recordings of phone calls. Wow. I think I'm going to have uh, these things capture your soul is going to be part of my my belief system. So don't do it. Like, no don't record yes. anything. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And that's the other thing is that, you know, all this footage comes from the leader who's like, I want everything. I want us to be in in history books in the next 100 years. So we better make sure that all of this is documented because <laughs> everything's on the up and up here. That famously yeah, well-documented that religion, Christianity. Well, I but mean, what? The, even the no, to be to be fair, that's the reason why we know it is because for the time it was well documented, well, actually, and so it spread. But it wasn't really at the time that was a thing. It was all the well, stuff was written after the fact? Okay, sure. Well, I um, mean, no, so you're, for... you're you're I, I'm, just, I'm sorry. Oh, no, okay. no, 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 you're right. Actually, actually, I'm 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 on your side here, Andrea. As a matter of fact, that that'll be my pick. Uh, Bart Ehrman's the historical the Jesus is a uh, uh the great courses course uh uh where it's like a, a penny is at a place in her late teens where she's not wanting to go to church and bonnie was like you gotta you gotta you gotta be learning something so the two of us are are listening to a, a breakdown of the historical jesus why do we know what we know it's fantastic it's a very very good course uh yeah uh, uh yeah i'll sorry. tell you who always had who always had a camera running though 
that Hitler guy. <laughs> Loved it. <laughs> that dude. Mm-hmm. See that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that what, your, to your point though, Justin. I always had a camera running. Now we want to tell the world how bad of a guy he is. Easy. Pol Pot, not a lot of cameras. Mao, not a lot of cameras. Not Hitler, a lot of cameras. Oh, is, is this on? Are we? Are we live? You know. No, and then, Stalin. Stalin guy. didn't fall for that one. Yep. Stalin yep. was like, nope. And erase the ones we do have. <laughs> Break <those. laughs> and kill the cameraman. <laughs> and kill the cameraman. And and whatever. Burn the books. Yeah. Uh, I got a I got a, a pick, uh, just a brief pick. This is uh, something we're covering on uh, Cord Killers. It's Spoiler in Time podcast. Uh, episode three just came out this week. It's Lovecraft Country, also on HBO. I'm I'm really digging this. I I think it's. It is more monster of the week than I thought it would be now that we're three episodes in, but I don't know the original book. Uh, Tom Merritt from Cord Killers says that the structure, at least from the first two episodes, the structure of the show follows the structure of the book pretty closely, which I would say is slightly unconventional from what you might consider from like a a prestige HBO show. Um, But I think it's really cool. This third episode that just came out this week was like, especially quote unquote spooky, like more of a horror story than the previous two and some more jump scare stuff that f- maybe felt a little cheaper. Um, but I, I'm, I'm really taken by, by the characters, uh, by the entire cast of characters that, that are in play and the strange world that they're building that parallels, not just, you know, real world uh, uh, discrimination in America, but also paralleling that with, magic and the occult uh i i think it's it's a really fascinating and really kind of thrilling adventure so far so lovecraft country anybody else i know brian you're watching it with with us for court killers yeah dude uh i uh, uh i only got part way through episode three i have to watch the rest of it but uh mm-hmm. but it looks like they take a pretty big gap between one two and then yeah we are in three i think they say it's uh uh months a, a couple of months at yeah. most yeah um, which is just weird. It's very, very weird. I don't, I, I am still trying to wrap my head of like, cause this is a self-contained, spoiler alert, this is a self-contained episode basically tonight or that on episode three, but then there's an arc maybe going on. There's, there's some things like it's, it's very kind of strange. Classic X-Files. Yeah. In a way that I have not experienced in quite a while. Most things have been very serialized as people want more prestige television. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's interesting. It's refreshing. Andrew? So I imagine if there was a TV series that was an episodic show that carried through a science fiction show where you had people like uh, uh, Andy Weir, Neil Stevenson, uh, Scalzi, uh, Peter F. Hamilton writing episodes. Well, that sounds like a, a, a real rogues gallery of a writing staff. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't it be amazing? Well, it doesn't it exist. Doesn't exist. You can't have it because the world doesn't Shoot. work that way. But if we go jump back in time to the 1960s in this little known science fiction show where you had people like Robert Block, the guy that wrote Psycho, Richard Matheson, one of the you know greatest science fiction TV and book writers ever, people like that, Harlan Ellison writing stories for an episodic show well, that would be called Star Trek, and it's why we still remember it to this day. Uh-huh. And I was watching an episode, and one, I watched one episode, and like my girlfriend's a big fan of Richard Matheson. I'm like, oh, yeah, Richard Matheson wrote this. And then we watched another episode, like Robert Block. I'm like, Robert Block wrote Psycho, and he wrote this episode. you know. And it was very interesting to think about, like, we haven't had anything really like that. We've had some anthology shows and stuff where like you might get some other people, but you start looking to some of the writers – who worked on the original, yeah, DC Fontana, who is a well-known Star Trek writer, but David Gerald, who Terrible Tribbles. We're just looking at the list here, but you get a lot of Theodore Sturgeon, okay? Theodore Sturgeon, very well-known science fiction writer. And so that was a thing that just sort of just surprised me was how often you would I would see a name where I'm like, oh, yeah, Norman Spinrad, okay? I mean, just kind of really awesome. And I think part of why the thing, the Star Trek was so iconic was that they brought in some of the best science fiction writers in that day, which they are a lot more affordable than I guess, but, um, uh, and that would be, uh, now you sort of, somebody maybe starts a franchise or a science fiction show and they maybe bring in one known writer or something like that, but to get a, a gallery like that writing for you, that's amazing. So yeah. classic Star Trek, those you don't know, like it's on a lot of the different platforms now, 
they've gone and redone the VFX. So instead of looking at the the old school, it's, it's CGI Enterprise and stuff. The prints, they took the original, like the film prints, and they've actually used them. So if you watch it on a 4K TV, it looks great. Wow. Uh, sound mix is not the best, but other than that, uh, you know, really, you know, just, just it's fun to watch it. Just sort of fun to watch it in this day and age and nice. appreciate have, like. Have we already discussed Lower Decks on this program? I think it was your pick a week or two ago. Yeah. Yeah. How was your You still enjoying Fan. it? Fan. Deeper, like even a deeper appreciation. It's just I haven't watched the latest one, but I hear I hear great things. But yeah, yeah. I, Lower Decks is Lower Decks is my favorite new Star Trek thing probably since Generation. Yep. Yeah, I think it's just yeah, you know. So so my pick classic Star. Also, go watch the Halix documentary on the uh, Defunct Land channel, the one about the 1981 Disney rock band. It was good. More people Lived up to expectations. It's great. It's great. I if you if you're like I have zero interests whatsoever, just watch the first twenty minutes and see what happens. Nice. Yeah, that's on the uh, Defunct Land channel, Disney's Forgotten Sci-Fi Rock Band. It's got sixty-seven negative and twelve thousand positive. <laughs> What and it's still like how many put a full documentary up there for free and 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 have that be just as awesome as that is that's great oh yeah what's the the view count right now uh one hundred and fifty nine thousand views it's not, and it's just it's not climbed and like it's just it just it, people need to see this <laughs> need to see this there you go we'll have of course we have all the links in the show notes yep so. cool gentlemen it's been after hey it has been after all right hey good shows today everybody really good stuff uh we're gonna come back with uh uh, the guys will be back with happy hour in about a half hour's time yeah yep and then we got cord killers up at uh six central yeah uh oh i forget who our who our guest is is it bill meeks i think it's no it wasn't yeah yes yes oh cool bill yeah, so uh, tune in for that, everybody. Justin Streams, Justin R. Young, at Andrew Main on Twitter for when he does all his stuff. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you later. See ya. Love you. Bye. Because you're driving me insane. Don't you say I never told you. Loving you is such a waste. Such a waste of my time. Such a waste of my life. Thanks for breaking my heart.